Uh, welcome to the Inside Out Lecture Series 2017-18. to 18. The mission of our programme is to bring the best minds of our generation to inspire and support the work students and staff do across the School of Art, Architecture and Design at Leeds Beckett University. To this end, we invite renowned speakers from around the globe to come and talk to us about their work. In order to enhance the cultural life of Leeds, we make the lecture series open to the general public and available to an international audience online. So today we are delighted to welcome Mishka Henna, who lives and works in Manchester in the UK. So not quite as far, he hasn't travelled quite as far as Sherry last week uh, from Sydney, Australia. Uh, but he has come on the Trans Pennine Express. Um, Mishka initially trained as a sociologist and in 2010 he decided to become an artist. Within a year the Tate Collection had purchased one of his book works and he had been selected as a signature artist for the Encounters with Photography exhibition in Arles, France. In 2013, he was awarded the ICP Infinity Award for Art and shortlisted for the Deutsche Bosch Photography Prize. I probably murdered that. Sorry about that. Um, in 2015, the Victorian Albert Museum purchased his 12-volume book, Astronomical. Um, you can see my copy there. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and he appeared on the April cover of Art Forum. I've got a little bit of a personal anecdote um, about Mishka. Um, in 2011, I was uh, one of the writers in residence with my friend Nick Thurston and Craig Dworkin down at the Whitechapel Gallery in London. And they have the London Art Book Fair there. And they have about 250 tables with different small publishing presses uh, present their work, present their um, books. Um, and Kenneth Goldsmith, um, the guy behind UberWeb in America, a very successful artist, came bundling into the Whitechapel and said to me, come and see this, Simon. And he was with Matthew Copeland, who's uh, one of the top curators in Europe. He said, forget the stuff in the Whitechapel. None of this stuff's any good. Come round the back and see where the real art is. And I thought, what is he talking about? So he took me outside the Whitechapel, round the back, and into an alleyway. And Mishka and some of his friends from this thing they, they do called the ABC Consortium had applied to have a table at the Whitechapel, had been turned down. But rather than actually accept that they weren't part of this London Art Book Fair, they set up their gallery actually on the back of the Whitechapel. And everyone from the Whitechapel was going around the back. And there were two works there that were just stunning. There was one called Astronomical, this one here, the 12 volumes. And there was another one called The Black Book. Um, both um, uh, were made through Blurred Books, and both have been rejected by Blurred, who said it's, they just cost too much to make these books. We can't make them for you. Um, they're just fantastic works, and it was really great um, to see Mishka and his work back then. In the age of the internet... Many of us have one foot firmly in an analogue past and one foot hesitantly in the digital future. But Mishka has fully embraced current technology and constructed his art practice by harvesting digital data off the web. Critics often talk about the smooth surfaces of cyberspace with its infinitely programmable flows of codes and information. They speak of how data is like a liquid that can be poured from one container to another. They speak of vast oceans of imagery and the fast-flowing currents of networked media. But the critic, Mark Poster, has suggested there is another side to cyberspace in which copyright law, fixed identities and censorship are continuously evaded and challenged. This is not the smooth surface of transparency and control, but rather a highly differentiated field of resistance, conflict and uncertainty. For me... Mishka's work offers us a site of resistance because it makes us question our existing ideas of what photography is and also invites us to think differently about how to navigate the digital. I'm really pleased that Mishka has travelled from his home in Manchester to be with us here in Rose Bowl Lecture Theatre via the Trans Pennine Express. If anyone should have been Skyped in, appeared as a digital avatar, it probably should have been Mishka. But I'm delighted he is here with us today in person and not as a digital spectre flickering away on a screen. Please join me in extending a very warm Yorkshire welcome to Mishka Henna. Hello. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Is this on? Oh, that's recording. All oh, right. Uh, well, thanks very much. Simon, for inviting me. It's a, a real uh, honour to be here. I did a talk a few months ago, and uh, only the organiser turned up. Um, so it was, I was just speaking to one person, um, even though I'd spent a day preparing the talk. So I'm a bit nervous to see so many of you. Um, I've not spoken to this many people for a while. Um, anyway, um, yes, uh, just to... Um, let you know, well, I'll be jumping from video to internet page to slideshow 
Um, so it's going to be a bit scatty, um, uh, but you know, um, I'm sure you can deal with it. Um, so anyway, well, let's pause this. Um, so this is astronomical. I'll, I'll be talking about this a little bit later. Um, but for now, right, let's go jump to the slideshow. So the first thing to say is that uh, I, didn't, I didn't study art or photography, actually. Um, I, I studied sociology, and uh, it was a, a, a brilliant thing to have done. I think it gave me a real uh, way of looking at the world and thinking about the world and how things are constructed and the extent to which everything around us is constructed. And uh, after I left... Uh, university, I tried all sorts of things. I didn't want to stay on in academia. I, st I started writing short stories. Um, I was a r r terrible writer. I just wasn't a writer. I had all these pretensions about what being a writer was, and I even moved to Paris to be a writer. That's how bad it was. And, um, and failed badly at, at that. And, um, and I had all these ideas about writing a novel and uh, realised after about six months that I just I couldn't do it. I didn't have the discipline to be a writer. So I moved back to England and uh, I carried on writing short stories. And I would make these little pamphlets of short stories that I would g give out to people. Um, and, uh, and then through that I met a theatre director who um, wanted to turn one of my little pamphlets into a, a play I in a field of theatre called physical theatre which is all about gesture, movement, dance, and so on. So stories are told not really through words, but through gesture and dance and, and physical movement and, um, and scenography. And I kind of got my apprenticeship, really, in art, I think, from those two, two three years that I spent in London doing physical theatre at the Battersea Art Centre under the tutelage of an amazing um, uh, theatre theater guy called uh, Amit Lahav with a company called Gecko. Uh, you can see a lot of the work online. Um, and through that, I kind of learn about discipline, actually, and about work, about how m m making art is, a, is a, a lot of work, actually, and it's a lot of ridding, a bad, getting rid of all your bad ideas before you get to the kind of very simple good ideas. And I feel that I learned an enormous amount from, from that. But um, it wasn't until I was 27, as I was on the kind of tail end of my experience in physical theatre, that... I went to a photography show um, at Tate, which was called uh, Cruel and Tender. And it was the first time that I saw for, um, art do the kind of stuff I was trying to do all along with my writing and so on, which was, in a way, to, 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 talk, with, to talk about the world without speaking. So in, when I was writing, when I was doing theatre and so on, I felt like so much of my work was... was kind of having all these ideas about the world and really and, and expressing them so overtly and so literally that really they, um, there was no mystery left. There was no, there was no room, really, for interpretation. And uh, the stuff that, uh, that really drew me into um, photography, a particular area of documentary photography, was this possibility of being able to talk about the world um, through images, which in a, in a way I felt were much more open-ended uh, and open to interpretation. And so for me, resulted in far richer work, actually, that was able to explore depths um, that maybe were in a way that maybe words couldn't. I mean, obviously, you know, um, it, it's, it's a very simplified view of, of things, but uh, it's a way of introduction. This is... Um, my, both my parents were architects. My, my uh, dad was an architectural te technician. He passed away last month. And, then, and in that month, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about his influence on my work and, um, and my parents' influence on my way of looking at things. My mum grew up in communist Poland and fled to Paris in 1967, and uh, she met my dad in Brussels, um, and, um, but they were both working as architects. And I kind of grew up with these architectural plans lying around all the time, and I would, every time I'd go to see them at work, they would be work, working on these plans and so on. And this is a, a, some plans that my dad did of our, for our house, in um, Manchester, which we moved into a couple of years ago. And um, the, the plans, I think, I guess the, the reason I'm showing these is because I feel that, for me, architecture is uh, such a fascinating field because, it, in effect, it's kind of like the invisible hand that, that orders uh, ev everything around us. So if you like, you know, in this room, there are uh, all, all of the 
the architecture is almost invisible in a way. And, and when I mean architecture, I don't just mean uh, the, the physical arc, uh, form of architecture, but also the infrastructure that lies underneath. Because the job of architects isn't just about how things should look, it's also about how to hide all of the stuff that makes the spaces function. So in this room, there are cables underneath uh, the floor, there are cables in the wall, pipelines, and so on, you know, hot water pipes, you name it. And the architect's job is to kind of make them sort of invisible in a way. There are schools that have made them, that have been all about making the infrastructure visible. But my parents were kind of part of, uh, you know, quite low-end sort of architecture in which, um, yeah, most of that job really was hiding all of the infrastructure. And I think all of my work, uh, the, the stuff that I've always been really fascinated by, the, 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 the work in sociology that I was really fascinated by, was all the stuff that reveals how things work, you know, how, how, how infrastructures work. And the infrastructures are very difficult to visualise, actually, but we'll get on to that later. So I made a lot of my work about um, visualising infrastructure. And uh, anyway, I just love these technical, I love technical drawings, you know, the precision of it, the, um, it, it was a nightmare working with my dad on uh, con converting our house, but the plans all look so clean and simple and trouble free, <laughs> but they weren't. Um, anyway, so when I, when I um, f first I kind of decided that I wanted to be a documentary photographer because I was so enraptured by this work that I'd seen and um, I called, can we dim some of the lights actually, is that possible? Can I do that here? <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, all right. Okay, no worries. So um, I started out, uh, I, I um, asked a friend of mine if she knew any photographers because I really wanted to learn how to use a camera. And uh, she put me in touch with a friend of hers, a Canadian, uh, called Liz Locke, who um, we've been together for 14, 15 years now. And anyway, we, we met in London and uh, we moved to Manchester because it was really affordable to live, basically. We were living in a squat in Hackney and um, we basically knew that if we moved to Manchester we could really have a go at, being, at, at trying to become and learn the craft of documentary photography. So we moved to Manchester and we very quickly um, set about getting small funding for little projects to make work around Manchester and the satellite towns of Manchester, very post-industrial satellite towns. And so we would learn about image making and about also about how to you know, um, manage relationships in, when you're producing documentary work like this. So this is Oldham, a town very close to where we used to live in ashton under line And uh, Oldham had this, these really crazy juxtapositions between white working class neighbourhoods and uh, very strong Muslim neighbourhoods set against a kind of backdrop of post-industrial decline. Um, and this is kind of the work that we were making. And uh, I was, uh, after about six years of working like this, I became really quite frustrated with photography. This is, um, this is Oldham's first ever gay pride parade. Um, obviously, that's not the parade. That's the, the audience uh, looking at the parade. But I was already trying to sort of experiment with different ways of looking at things. And, um, and so here, instead of focusing on a parade, which we all, we all know what the gay pride parade looks like, we can see it in our heads, the reactions of kind of... Uh, Everybody else in Oldham looking onto the parade said more about Oldham uh, than than the parade itself. I thought so. I was all, but I was getting really quite frustrated with uh, documentary photography. I found it quite limiting in its kind of um, approach and methods and so on. And also, I found it quite limited in its ethical and moral kind of um, anchors. You know, it's a, when you work in that field, it's it's there's this kind of mystical. Uh, unspoken rules about ethics and morality and so on and uh, stuff that I'd studied uh, when I was studying cultural th theory and sociology but which I found as a practitioner not very useful actually and quite limiting in uh, allowing you to look at a much broader range of issues so anyway I started to revisit some of the theory that I, I found really interesting and not really not so much theory but writings by some of the kind of far out um, French cultural theorists like Baudrillard and Virilio um, and other Foucault. I, I really loved all those um, writings. Uh, but th there's a book by uh, there's a number of books by Baudrillard which I really absolutely loved called um, 
Cool Memories and uh, America and Transparency of Evil, and they're almost incomprehensible. Right? I studied this stuff for, for four years, and I could barely understand it, even at the end of it. Um, but occasionally you'd come across these nuggets which I found really super interesting and influential. And this was one such um, fragment in a book called Fragments, Cool Memories. Uh, one dreams of a stealthy idea which would slip through all the detection systems without being spotted and unfailingly reach its target. Now, one of the things that I found really restricting about photog uh, documentary photography was the visibility of the photographer, actually. You know, we live in a world that's surrounded by cameras. There are cameras everywhere. I'm being recorded now. Uh, some of you might have taken some pictures. M there might be some CCTV cameras. You know, the CCTV cam cameras all over the streets. We're constantly being photographed by these invisible cameras. And so to be a photographer in the world now is a very visible declaration. And yet um, I, find it, I find it quite uh, limiting. Somebody's taking a picture right now. But, uh, and I, find it quite limit uh, I found it very limiting, actually. And the character of the photographer was something that was becoming more and more sort of talked about. And um, anyway, I was reading some Baudrillard and Virilio and that, and I was also starting to take an interest in conceptual art because conceptual artists had none of the kind of moral and unethical sort of uh, breaks that uh, I felt uh, that documentary photographers had. So this is Chris Burden, one of my favourite artists, in 1973, making, doing what, what for me is one of my favourite pieces of art I've ever seen, uh, which is... Um, uh, at about 8 a.m. at a beach near the L.A. International Airport, Burden shot, uh, fired several shots with a pistol at a Boeing 747 taken off from the airport. Now, that is such a provocative, symbolic act, and I, I think he got arrested for this, actually. Um, but the, the great irony is that uh, the bullet would never reach the plane. The bullet cannot physically reach the plane because the plane is travelling too fast. And the, the, the telephoto lens is, la is, is uh, distorting the um, proximity of the plane to the pistol. So in effect, uh, Burden, wh whether he fired the shot or not, we don't even know. But it's such a, it's such a provocative, symbolic act that, uh, that can be read in so many different ways. And it's such a powerful image, in a way, that for me sort of pierces through so many facades. And anyway, I just love the... Um, the, the audacity of it in a way, uh, and that this kind of single artist could uh, confront the entire kind of um, industrial complex in, in such a in, in a single image, if you like. And then uh, Sol Lewitt is another artist who I was really um, really interested in. Again, for a similar for similar reasons in a way they're very sim simple gestures i found i found that with the conceptual art it's very simple gestures that could mean so much and this is a uh, solo wit connecting all the ifs ands or buts with green lines in a, on a single page of text which and a text is about an artist i think as far as i can tell but what lewitt is doing there for me is uh He's taken a, a, a very simple page of text and he's uncovered or um, he's either uncovered or created an entire infrastructure within that text that until he performed that gesture was unseen. And again, that's something that I found really uh, quite striking. And, um, and the other thing that uh, this... Uh, uh, coincided with with me was me realizing that so much of our, of my photography work and of my peers was happening through the interface of the computer and it felt it seemed that all of us uh, spent most of our lives at a computer and then it struck me that actually if I was to make work that that was really um, vital about the now about the time that we're living in the camera was actually a kind of nostalgic object and that the, 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 the real camera, the real tool that I should be working with, was the computer and the internet. So um, I started kind of messing around, really. I mean, uh, we weren't getting as much work with uh, our photography. The funding was being cut in a lot of, I think, fields, areas that we were uh, working in. And uh, Facebook w had started to uh, appear. This was in 2009. And I'd noticed that, that um, people on Facebook were spending a lot of time 
kind of creating their, fa their profile pictures, right? At the time when Facebook came out, people took profile pictures very seriously. You know, they, they always wanted uh, to look good and to appear quite successful. When you reach my age, well, this was my uh, mid-30s at this point, early 30s, and uh, when you get to early 30s, you kind of uh, seem, it seems to be that uh, everyone's trying to show that they're doing quite well for themselves. So anyway, I started messing around and uh, um, I started basically finding pictures of winners on the internet and I just put my profile, my passport photo on the photographs of winners and I made a book uh, using print on demand um, which means you can get one book made because obviously this book was going to be a failure um, and I called it Winning Mentality and I gave it a pseudonym of Victor Starr and you can see it won lots of awards this book um, and these were some of the pictures and so these were just pictures that I would find online and it was a more of a, like a comic comedic, uh, it was comedy really <laughs> it's vocational student of the year um, I mean if you saw pictures of my mum uh, 30 years ago it's frighteningly similar without, <laughs> without, the, fa without the facial hair this is uh, winner of March, March's Heart of 4H award for outstanding volunteer service this is Mr. Natural Philadelphia, novice men's winner. And so obviously the more time you kind of start delving into this stuff, the more you realise how, how kind of a ridiculous prizes are because there's a, there's a prize and, a, and an award for just about anything. This is, I really love this one, this is the Pinnacle Marketing Award winner, best in show for product penetration entry. I mean, <laughs> how specific is that? King of the Knob, obviously. Um, so anyway, so I, I would put these up on, uh, as my Facebook profile pictures and I was kind of getting reactions. I had thought of photography as documentary photography as a very earnest, very earnest, serious pursuit. And uh, yeah, actually I was getting reactions to this kind of work that was, uh, I don't know, it was just really interesting. You know, I, I'd kind of done it as a joke, but at the same time it had a sort of, you know, undertone. It was like a critique of capitalism in a way, and uh, anyway, but, but done without that kind of earnest approach and uh, so for me this was something entirely new and um, as, uh, science, as Simon says so I, we, we, we went to uh, I joined a co-op of our artists ABC and we, we took a table at the White Chapel this is the year before a couple of years before astronomical round the back um, so we had a table at the White Chapel and the Tate the, the woman who uh, buys the works for Tate are, are uh, collection of artist books came into the hall and everybody's freaking out because it's Maria White she said so I just thought well pff, you know I might as well go for a drink next door because I just had one copy of Winning Mentality this is it here I'd only got one co I'd only got one copy made because I thought you know it's nobody's going to buy it anyway it's expensive to make because it's print on demand so it's like it's hardback so I've got to pay an extra 15 quid for that so I had to sell it for like 45 quid to get my money back and anyway, I got a call when I was in the bar next door from a friend at the table saying, oh my God, you're not going to believe it, Maria, Maria White's bought your book. And I thought, my God, that's, uh, that's insane. I was, just, I was only messing about. But suddenly, um, uh, the doors kind of opened. And, it, and I, I guess it was a really great lesson, actually, because in a way, the, the instinct that made this work was, a very, was almost innocent and... Uh, for, I kind of made it for fun and out of pure joy. And, uh, and that's what get, got noticed, in a way. And I guess as, as art students, you know, no doubt, um, a lot of the stuff you're reading is extremely dry. <laughs> a lot of the research you're doing is extremely dry. And that, I hate to say, it has the potential to lead to work that is extremely dry. And I think, uh, for me, I've never thought about art as really a way of, of making money. It's so hard to make. Uh, money in art that really you're best off forgetting about it and making it purely out of joy and fascination and curiosity and um, so I, that's what I did I kind of ditched the documentary photography and started working in this way really and every everything I was doing was to satisfy my own kind of curiosity in a way and my own interest in things and was done with a kind of slightly mischievous with a spirit of kind of mischievy and um humour with under a lot of it but also challenging some of the foundations of um, the very serious world of, doc of documentary photography 
This is one of the next books that I made. Again, a, a book that was made print on demand. Photography is, as you can tell, I've been, I was thinking a lot about photography at the time. And uh, I just collected thousands of phrases that I could find from books, magazines, technical manuals, press releases, and so on, just with a simple Google search. And uh, all the phrases had to begin with the words photography is. So photography is like making cheese. Photography is like diamond cutting. Um, so the, the, the book kind of contains profound statements about photography written by some of the, the, the names we all know, like Susan Sontag and uh, John Tagg and so on. But at the same time, you might have a 14-year-old blogger whose phrase has appeared in the search result and who ends up side to side with all these things. So in a way, it was a, an attempt to sort of democratize the discourse of photography and take it beyond the very kind of limited n number of um, experts, if you like, that kind of dominate the field. I've got some copies. I brought some copies with me here if you're interested. It's, um, uh, uh, they're very cheap. <laughs> Special deal for today. Uh, anyway, so I kind of launched myself into, uh, into the internet in a way as, and, and thought very much of the internet as material. And um, one of the things that I really started to wonder about was the potential to join the dots in a way. I didn't know it at the time, but later on I realized that what I was doing was a form of geospatial intelligence, which is, um, to, to simplify that basically, it means that you're basically taking information from multiple sources, joining it together to, pr to build a picture, to create a picture of something. So in, uh, in government, in development organizations and military, geospatial intelligence is a very important part of strategic um, decision making. So you'll, have seen, you'll, you'll all have seen the satellite images of, um, of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction on, and so on. You know, you'll, have, you'll all have know what that looks like. And that's, that's geospatial intelligence as we know it. But I started kind of um, thinking about it in relation to some of the uh, works made by artists in the 1960s, like Ed Ruscha, who worked especially with uh, artist books. And in my co-op of artists, we had an idea to do to celebrate Ed Ruscha's birthday by his 75th birthday by creating a range of works. And I created uh, th this was my contribution, uh, one of m a number of contributions, 51 U.S. military outposts. So I'll just play the trailer for that. I made a trailer. Oh, well, everybody's heard about the bird. B -b bird, bird, bird. The bird's a winner. Well, the bird, bird, bird. The bird is a winner. Well, the bird, bird, bird. Well, the bird is a winner. Well, the bird, bird, bird. The bird's a winner. Well, the bird, bird, bird. Well, the bird is a winner. Well, the bird, bird. The bird's a winner. Well, the bird, bird, bird. The bird's a winner. Well, the bird, bird, bird. Well, the bird is a winner. Well, the bird, bird. The bird's a winner. Well, don't you know about the bird? Well, everybody knows that the bird is a winner. Well, the bird. possible to create a kind of map of uh, 51 US military outposts in 51 different countries around the world uh, using, now it's very easy to, to find about two thirds of them because they're, you literally go on the US Army website and um, you can see the bases in all the different countries but the last, the final third were very difficult to find and I had to rely on uh, lots of different sites and data leaks uh, to make the work. Um, so it coincided with the WikiLeaks data uh, dump in 2010. And from that, I was able to find bases um, that were kind of hidden and covert. And I would uh, basically find the imagery on Google Earth. And the image, this is a project where the image is kind of irrelevant. It's more the act and the gesture of building this picture, a map of a massive kind of military industrial complex but as an artist, and present it as an artist book. So um, this, I was doing a talk in Luxembourg, actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, 
somebody has worked on that site. That was a bit scary, actually. But um, yeah, he uh, he confirmed that this was the central region storage facility. So this is where this is a site where so, an enormous amount of the U.S. military's uh, uh, stockpiles and uh, logistical equipment and so on is kept in Europe. So these are often very remote airfields and bases and so on. And um, and anyway, so that that was my and it, I was kind of thinking of um, it, I was thinking about if Ed Ruscha was to up update 26 gasoline stations or 34 parking lots today, if he was to make that work today, what might it look like? And I might and I kind of imagined that it would be uh, 51. It might look like some, something like 51 U.S. military outposts. Um, and then uh, basically, I started out. Uh, initially making just every project was a was a print on demand project M really for practical reasons because i didn't have much money and uh, they're they're relatively cheap to make you know you're only to really talking about screenshots and um getting a single book published printed so a book you know i could make a book like 51 years military outposts and the whole project would cost me like 40 quid basically plus the internet connection and having a computer but um even my computer wasn't very good so um just to say that you know you r didn't really need much to make this work, but then as a, as the work got more and more known, I got invited to have exhibitions, and then I had to kind of figure out how to translate some of these book works into exhibition installations. And this is one example at Carol Fletcher in London, um, in a show called Black Diamond, and um, and it was, uh, all 51 bases were presented on plinths, so you kind of moved up on a grid, so you kind of moved around. Um, the world, if you like, in that sense. And this was a, a presentation at the Grundy. And I, I, li I like to constantly uh, kind of try and refresh ways of presenting the work. And the Grundy didn't have much money, so this is, a, this is the budget version of, because plants are very expensive, unless you're Simon Morris and you know how to get a lot of cheap plants done for very cheap. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, one way. And then um, I, uh, <coughs> obviously it's impossible to work on something like 51 U.S. military outposts and not consider censorship because there was no censorship. I, I didn't come across any censorship of U.S. military bases, which surprised me. But then when I did research the subject, I found that um, the Dutch actually um, censored the, the landscape like nobody else. And the weird thing about the Dutch is that when, when um, Google Earth was introduced in 2005, they, they kind of freaked out and censored hundreds of landscapes in the country, but they used the most spectacular Photoshop effect to, send, to hide these bases. So it kind, of, it kind of does the opposite, really. It's not, uh, it's not a very useful way of hiding anything. And um, I'll give you an example of that. And it, it, it struck me, actually, that uh, when, I, when I was coming across those landscapes and framing them, it struck me that, in a way, they were the perfect kind of um, contemporary landscape that sort of fused th this kind of weird, uh, irrational fear of terrorism that we have with the digital age. So in a way, you've got the kind of... Uh, each of those images is a collision between a kind of analogue world and a digital world. And what's so interesting about Holland is that the Dutch landscape, every inch of the Dutch landscape, is engineered to protect itself from flooding, a natural threat. And, uh, and here, what the censors have done is inadvertently created this digital landscape um, to protect themselves from a perceived human threat. So there's a combi combination, weirdly, in Holland, of that natural threat and a human threat, uh, as represented in the landscape. So this is Nordwick and Zee, the one I just showed you. This is live um, on Google Maps. And just to show you, this is, um, that's the, you can see. And just to show you kind of how absurd it is in an age where everything is photographed, that to, to try and hide anything immediately... Uh, rings alarm bells. So even here, you know, we can just grab the little stick man and sort of dump, dump him in and we just, you know, float underneath the skin of the censored, of the censorship and have a look around, you know. I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's like the dullest place on, the, in, on earth, but, um, you know, we can certainly have a go at trying to figure out what they're trying to hide. Um, so anyway, I find that Fascinating in a way, you know, and, and a kind of demonstration of the absurdity of of the whole thing, but also revealing maybe the extent to which 
the, the authorities maybe think of us as visually illiterate, you know, that we wouldn't spot this and think, oh, you know, this is like the worst camouflage ever. Um, anyway. So yeah, I, I, so I made a, I made a, again, I made a print-on-demand book called um, D Dutch Landscapes and presented these censored landscapes next to uncensored landscapes. So just l l kind of um, raw images of the, of the Dutch landscape, satellite images, but showing the engineering. And uh, the patterns were very similar. Um, now, uh, I, I should say that at this point, this was 2000, between 2010 and 2013, I had no idea, I don't think anybody knew, how open the internet would be and how long it would remain open for. So I kind of dived in and tried to make as much work as I could. Um, and um, my, my partner at the time, uh, my partner, uh, who is still my partner, uh, she was making... <laughs> what, what am I thinking? Um, can you cut that, actually? <laughs> anyway... Um, my partner was uh, ca carried on working as a documentary photographer and was working with sex workers in Manchester. And so we were getting to know uh, some of the sex workers really quite well. And uh, their stories were just in incredibly complex and fascinating and uh, unfathomable, actually. And uh, she faced a real problem of how to represent them visually because it seemed like an impossible task to do. How do you represent any anybody, actually? How do you take a portrait of anyone in any meaningful way um, that reflects the, the richness of, of their being and their experiences. And uh, I'd say it's impossible, actually. But anyway, she was really struggling, and, uh, and I thought I would um, sort of give her a hand, maybe, and uh, try and, and, and think about what she could do with the landscapes. And uh, so I went on Google Street View, and this was an image taken behind Piccadilly Station with Street View. It's the, it's the first thing that we, that we saw, that we encountered, and um, uh, pick this area behind Piccadilly, it was completely derelict. It's changed a lot in the last five years, but it was completely derelict. And um, we knew this is where the women worked. And so Liz was maybe going to go and take some pictures of the landscapes. But when I saw this image, uh, the thing that absolutely I found astounding was, well, first of all, we kind of recognised, we, we had a pretty uh, clear idea of who we thought that might be. Um, but also... The, that lone kind of uh, figure in the landscape with the face etched out, um, to me, with the, with the imperfections of the image being what they are in street view, where the stitching isn't perfect, where it's a really wide-angle uh, lens, there was something about that image that I found to be absolutely astounding. So I kind of dived uh, deeper and uh, found that there was a ho all these communities of men online who would share information on where they could find sex workers around the world, and they would uh, often use Google Street View. So uh, I kind of dived into that world and uh, just kept coming across astounding images. And I settled on two places, uh, and that was the, the very remote parts of Spain and Italy. There was something about the combination of the landscape, this green kind of luscious landscape, quite romantic in a sense, punctured by the presence of these women. Now, we don't know if they're sex workers at all. I don't, I don't say that they are. And in the books, they're, they're not presented as sex workers either. But they're these lone female figures, uh, often dressed in, you know, in quite vulnerable outfits and looking very vulnerable in the middle of nowhere. And um, I so I produced this collection of images in, in no man's land. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> the book kind of went... I mean, I, I, made, I made six copies of this book because they were like 30 quid each to make. And I uh, just put them on my website and very quickly it went, they went viral. So there was a sex blogger in uh, L.A. who wrote a n really nice piece about it, actually. I don't know how she came across the work. She was called Violet Blue. You can still find her review online. And th th that review generated an enormous amount of animosity from uh, some feminist sex workers on the west coast of America who immediately wanted to have the book banned. So they wrote to Blurb and uh, requested for the book to be banned and kind of ha had a kind of online campaign. Um, they enlisted the support of um, 
a woman called Belle de Jour in England, uh, who was a writer who absolutely detested the series. And um, other photojournalists jumped on board, and uh, one called me a conceptual masturbator. Um, <coughs> she thought it was quite flattering, actually. Um, <laughs> and anyway, and, uh, and obviously, it, you know, I started selling lots of copies of this book because the minute you want to ban, I mean, the last thing you should do is get, pay any attention to it, anything that you want banned because the minute you do, you're just pouring fuel on the fire. So anyway, I brought out a second volume, um, <laughs> which is there. And um, yeah, because I kept coming across uh, incredible images. I just thought visually, you know, I would never take pictures like this. And I think that's another thing um, worth mentioning about all of my work, that I'm, in working the way I do, I'm constantly surprised by the material I'm generating. I, I could, I, you know, again, I, I could never expect to make work that looks like this. I would never, set, I would never begin and know what I was going to get in the end. And I think that's one of, uh, again, that makes the, making the work so much more interesting. Anyway, um, I, um, when I finished No Man's Land, I was kind of, I'll be honest with you, I was sick of the controversy. Anytime I did a talk, I didn't even want to talk about it today um, because I, I get attacked usually at the end with the, the stuff you can all imagine. And, uh, but Simon was like, oh, no, you've got to show that. You've got to show that. I want you to talk about that. So I did. So it's on you, Simon, if I start getting vitriol at the end of this talk. But anyway, I was, so, I was really fed up with um, the animosity that I was getting from that work. And I thought, you know what, I'll do something. I, I, I want to make something now that's uh, really you know, unproblematic in a way, and, uh, the, 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 which was astronomical. Again, working with print, print on demand, one of the miracles of print on demand is how cheap it is to make print on de- uh, to make black and white books. Color books are very expensive, but black and white books are so cheap. So um, I was lo- using Lulu for this, not um, Blurb. And uh, Lulu basically for five pounds you could get five hundred and six pages of of uh, a five hundred and six page book. Right now, Lulu is aimed at kind of aspirational writers. Right, people like me who who think they're good at writing but aren't. And, um, and so it's very cheap to make. And obviously, I, so I, I basically filled them. This is a scale model of the solar system, by the way. I should say that before <laughs> I go on. But uh, on pa- that, so er- the width of each page is a million kilometers. And so on pages one and two is the sun, the diameter of which is about 1.6 million kilometers. And then um, on page 155 of volume one is Earth. Uh, uh, so if I go back to... Um, the video. I made a video about it, um, which there was a fashion at the time to make. There still is to make these um, book trailers, in which the books are handled very. You know, the photo books are generally, you know, very precious and uh, are very expensive to make. And um, I was kind of um, having a laugh at it, really. Uh, by making this kind of print-on-demand book that I just filled with black ink. Um, let me find Earth. What's, what's that? Mercury. That's Mercury. That's Venus. And there's Earth. There we are. We're on page 155 of Volume 1. And then uh, Jupiter is in Volume 2. Saturn's in Volume 3. Uh, um, I've never found Neptune, but I know it's in there somewhere. Uh, it's like volume eight or something, um, and Uranus. And then on the on the last page of volume twelve, on page six thousand, is Pluto, which is a tiny pixel. And um, and then and then I, I sat on the I made this project and I showed it in this space outside the Whitechapel, which is what Simon was talking about. But it wasn't until about a year after that because I didn't release it for a while. I wasn't sure about it. I wasn't sure if it was any good or not. And after a year, I. Um, I was kind of pondering whether to release it and what I should put on the spine. And then I realized that my name had 12 letters. <laughs> so there it was. You know, I'm, I'm God, basically. <laughs> uh, so that was it. I thought, wow, that is a divine intervention. I must release this work. And, uh, and I did, and, it, and it, it, it did really well. But basically, uh, Lulu kind of went a bit mad at me because I started selling, I sold 130 sets in the end before Lulu wrote to me and said, what the hell are you doing? 
Every book which we're selling to you for a fiver has £40 worth of black ink in it. Because black ink is really expensive, actually. Um, so uh, it was costing, each, volu- each set was costing Lulu uh, like about 500 quid to make. And I was only selling them for 120. Um, but also I, I started getting loads of like hate mail from um, like tree, tree uh, people saying, you know, <laughs> you, I'm not joking, you're a murderer. Uh, what's wrong with you? Every book is killing trees, you know, all of that. So I thought, oh, do you know what? Anyway, um, after, after uh, <coughs> I, I, uh, I kind of, as you can see, a lot of my work is kind of about scale. It's an attempt to try and, you know, envisage scale or represent scale. Scale of industry, the scale of sex work, um, the scale of uh, the photography discourse, whatever. And... Um, I set my sights on industry next, and uh, I, I started working with um, uh, uh, ma- making work about oil fields. Actually, oil fields I think are the most extraordinary infrastructure. That it's in- oil fields are unbelievable. It's mind blowing if you think about it. What oil fields are? They kind of dig. You know, this machinery that we've invented that digs three miles below the Earth's surface sucks out dead organic matter that's millions of years old, and then makes plastic chairs out of you know it's an extraordinary industry and anyway while I was um, but at the same time very difficult to photograph very extremely difficult to photograph an oil field now I've skipped the oil field section because uh, there's not going to be enough time but while I was looking for the oil fields I came across these structures and uh, this I'd never seen before and I had no idea what I was looking at uh, but it turns out that they're, they're, f- they're called feedlots they're industrial cattle farms in the US I made a, I made a uh, actually let me show you some of the images first. Uh, whoops. Oh no. Hang on, where are we? I've got to be quick before I lose any more audiences. <laughs> <laughs> fleeing. Okay, so um, that's a close-up. So what I would do is I would take hundreds of screenshots of really high-res uh, American landscapes captured by the satel- but aren't, that aren't available on Google Earth and other satellite imaging programs. And I would make these massive um, prints, basically, um, showing the detail of these industrial feedlots. Now, I'll show you, um, I'll show you a trailer that I made for that series. I had a show in Liverpool a few years ago and made this trailer for the show. It's called Precious Commodities. June is officially Beef Month here across the state. And joining us for this week's Ag Minute is Kristen Oaks. And let me guess, we're going to talk about beef. Oh, my U of all people should know that it is what's for dinner. And here in Louisiana, we don't really have any feedlots, unlike the Midwest. But those feedlots are a very important part of the beef industry. At the dawn of the 20th century, cattle were free to roam the rangelands with little or no fences. But by the end of the century, most cattle were finished on feedlots. Feedlots or feed yards were developed post World War II due to the rise of fast food operations. Consumers demanded more and better beef at a low price. The idea of a feedlot allowed producers to meet those quality demands and maintain a low cost. These new facilities could house and feed thousands of animals and prepare them for slaughter. The close quarters enable cattle to gain weight faster through grain feeding and protein supplements so they may reach a mature slaughter weight much quicker than traditional grazing methods. Today there are more than 700 feedlots in the United States alone and most of those are located in the Midwest areas. Some lots contain more than 100,000 head of cattle at one time, giving you more beef for your buck. So, <clears throat> just to summarize, basically an industrial feedlot, t- traditionally it would take uh, five years for a farmer to, to have its cows reach a mature weight. And these industrial feedlots reduce that time to 18 months because they feed the cattle a mixture of growth hormones, <coughs> antibiotics, and protein supplements. So basically, it's like an accelerated life cycle. Uh, the, 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 the animals aren't slaughtered there, but what you can see is those lakes, those giant lakes that you can see 
are the toilets, basically. That's where all of the... So there's like, in this... In this um, hang on a second. I can't go back. Anyway, uh, there's about 30,000 cattle in this feedlot. And, um, and that's the piss and shit, basically, of 30,000 uh, cows. And the, chemi- the farmers use different chemicals to try and break it down, uh, that waste, and that's why you get different colours. But again, I, didn't this, I put this series online, and it went viral very quickly, especially in the US. And I had no idea, but a Reuters journalist called me up and said, uh, have you been in any trouble with this series? And I said, no, why? And she said, well, there are laws in the US that make it illegal to photograph these sites. And uh, the reason being that the beef industry is so powerful that they enacted laws that made the photographing of these feedlots illegal because they didn't want American consumers knowing where the beef came from. And uh, so in a way, or just by a single image search, uh, by just scanning the satellite imager and making these screenshots, I kind of come across something that was just mind-blowing to your average American. And... Um, Meat Packing Journal, the, the, the series kind of went slightly crazy. I don't think I'll ever make a work like it again. But uh, it kind of travelled and circulated all, all around the web. And um, the German Ministry of Agriculture were in touch with me a few months ago. They're, they're using some of the work in a brochure about agriculture. Meat Packing Journal, which is, as you can imagine, a sympathetic journal for the meat packing industry. Even they loved the series and they included it in their um, magazine. And an art forum... Uh, included it on the cover, and um, I, I uh, and then and then protesters have used it. Uh, some of the imagery as well. Uh, this is uh, Nayasani who uh, got in touch with me in Va- from Vancouver, who wanted to make a poster um, to, to to on a campaign. And uh, anyway, I think uh, for me, this is I think the, the series I'm proudest of um, because. I, I, the way that the work circulates in the world and the way it's read by other people, for me, is as much part of the work as anything else. Like, if the work doesn't um, circulate, then I, I, I think of it as a failure, in a way. And so the way it's kind of taken on by other people, I really, I'm really i fascinated by it, and I document all of, all of it. So there's a, a self-published writer in France who used that image on the cover of, of his book, and I say yes to anyone who wants to use it so long as they send me a copy of whatever it is they're making, because I love the, I love the possibility of building up this archive, of this, the way this one image has kind of circulated in all sorts of different material and political forms. Um, now, um, this is a, a new series I've been working on, uh, and uh, it's based on a restricted airspace in the UK. Now, I came across this map, um, which is kind of an amazing map, of the UK. This is all of the restricted airspace in the UK. Now, er- anything is red is for military use. They're testing weapons, um, they're firing ranges, uh, and, and so on. The things in purple are like, you just do not go anywhere near, near those areas. They can be nuclear power stations or whatever. But I was really fascinated by the graphic form of um, these boundaries. And um, I thought, would be really interesting to create kind of landscapes based on those um, forms. So um, what I did is, um, so these are the details. Now, th- th- those maps are created by the Ministry of Defence and the Civil Aviation Authority. Any pilot that goes up in the, in the air has to know that map. And uh, what I love about it is that, in a way, it's a kind of, it's a sort of hidden landscape in a way. It's, it's around us, we, we inhabit it, but we don't know it's there, we don't see it. And I'm also fascinated by the way in which the military and the Civil Aviation Authority have kind of created a kind of a, la- a, a, a way of composing landscape that is very much for them, um, but is also for us, I think, a new way to conceive of landscape as something that is, you know, that has a military uh, purpose in mind. So these are the coordinates that are published alongside the maps that delineate the boundary marks for the landscape. So I've just the shapes that you can see there follow exactly those coordinates. And the graphical form that I'm using there is the graphical form that's found on the maps. And then the different colours are um, uh, refer to different reasons for why it's a restricted airspace. So and then I love the the text as well, a circle 1.9 nautical mile radius centered on 
uh, coordinates. And it, it, for me, it makes me think a lot of uh, Richard Long and uh, you know, his walk through landscape and the way he kind of represents those. And so I'm kind of taking you know, one form from one place, mixing it with another. So it's a kind of remix in a way. But, um, and, it, and then there's a satellite image, um, obviously, which shows all of the infrastructure within that restricted airspace. And then uh, I recently started uh, getting my framer to build these as actual picture frames so that it's not a kind of standard uh, landscape frame. It's kind of an irregular shape frame. Pretty difficult to do, but um, it's re it's really they're really quite beautiful. Okay, so uh, I'm going to wrap up soon, but basically um, I'm just going to show you a few more projects. These are re very recent works. Now, as I've been... Uh, making um, my way into the art world, or I should say the, the art world kind of has, has uh, taken me on, if you like, it's made me obviously realise and learn, have, I've had to learn very quickly a lot about how art works, how, about editioning, about the value, the commodity value of artworks, about who buys the work, about why one work is more valuable than the other, and so on. And I thought, I, I thought one day I should make work about this. Now, there's something called the Golden Ratio, which is the Fibonacci sequence. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a mathematical formula that's uh, kind of a universal formula. It exists in other galaxies as well as here. It exists uh, on the atomic scale um, and so on. And it's a series of numbers that go 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. It's an infinite sequence. It's the two previous numbers added together to make the third number. And so on Valentine's Day, uh, I was at the studio on my own, obviously, um, I'd been in a relationship for a long time, so Valentine's Day by this point is... Uh, that's an awful thing to say. Can you cut that as well, please? <laughs> Before I went home and treated my beautiful partner to an amazing dinner, I was sitting at the studio on my own, and I, made, I, I started the series like this. So uh, I, I painted zero dollars on a piece of cardboard, and uh, I decided that basically I would make... I would, do, I would put a dollar sign in front of each painting... And a painting, a painting would only be made when the previous one had sold. And also, um, I would sell it at the price on the painting. So this, or I would gift it. So this is a gift to my partner. It's one dollar. This is the second dollar painting. This is a gift to my daughter. Um, she has it on her bedroom wall, and I'm always nervous when her friends come round. I put it quite high up on her wall so that they can't reach it. Um, the, and then a friend, I told a friend about it. The other thing is this would only be a word-of-mouth project. And only people, people would only learn about it from word-of-mouth. So either if they came to do a studio visit or if I was telling them about it in a bar or whatever. Uh, then uh, I, get, I get, uh, gave this to my mum. Another really good friend of mine heard about it. He bought the $5 painting for $5, obviously. I gave, uh, I gave this one to my dad. Um, a friend of mine came over from Spain. He bought this one for $13. <coughs> and then I had a friend of mine helping me in the studio, and he, he uh, wanted the $21 one. And uh, a, another really good friend of mine, a plasterer in Manchester, he gave me 20 quid at the time. $34 was 20 quid, I think. 25 quid, maybe. Um, friend, another friend bought this. A writer from London came up to do an interview with me. I told him about the work. He bought the $89 painting. Uh, then suddenly my, uh, the, my mate who bought the $21 one, he started calling up his uh, rich friends, and they started buying them. It's a real painting. Now, I'm a rubbish... I've, as, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a pretty... I'm a rubbish painter, but I love painting. And in a way, this was a way to um, allow me to paint, uh, even though I'm really not very good at it. And I couldn't believe I got to $610. I was like, wow, I can't believe somebody's paying $610 for this. I mean, I tried, I made it as best as I could, but I'm just not a very good painter. <laughs> and then uh, I did a talk in um, Italy, and a gallerist bought the $987 painting. And then Richard Misrak, who uh, turned out to be a, become a really good friend of mine, he's a really great photographer, American photographer. You should look up his work. He... Loved the idea, so he bought the $1,597 painting. And then at this point, I'm starting to get nervous because I, you know, I don't, I'm not a very good painter, 
But somebody uh, is possibly going to buy, sp spend two and a half thousand dollars on a painting. So a friend of a friend bought this one. Couldn't believe it. And then I had a show in New York, and um, a, a guy called Neon McAvoy bought this one. And then um, a gallerist in San Francisco, Jeffrey Frankel, he bought the $6,765 painting. This was made by some uh, tombstone makers in Salford, near where I live. And I painted it white, in white enamel. They sandblasted it into a, piece of, into a beautiful piece of uh, granite. And this is the latest one. This is the one that's... Uh, for sale now. It's been for sale for quite a while, <laughs> um, since March. And uh, this is massive. You can climb it. Um, and uh, I got somebody to make this because uh, I was freaked out by the fact that it would cost so much. So I spent quite a lot of money getting it made. And, uh, and it's not sold. But, um, but, and it's the best one. It's the only one. That's amazing. I've only just thought of that. It's the only one that's actually been properly made. And it can't sell. Because it's a lot of money, obviously. But anyway, so I thought, a couple of weeks, I thought, oh, do you know what I should do? Because I really love this series, and I thought, and so many people have said, oh, I wish I'd got in earlier. And I started thinking, well, the, the reproductions of paintings are what makes the paintings really valuable. You know, the Mona Lisa is only worth so much because there's so many reproductions of it. So I thought, I know, I'll start doing print reproductions of the paintings, but I'll, only do, I'll, I'll do them all in, in an edition of 100, and I'll only do the next edition... When, this when the first one is sold out. So last week I sold, uh, two weeks ago, I did a print reproduction of the $1 painting and sold it for a dollar, which is 76p. And I put it on my website and it's, uh, and it's sold in like 10 hours. Um, and people are saying, oh, I can't believe I didn't get in there. And I'm like, well, look, don't worry. There's a second dollar painting <laughs> that will come out. So if you're interested, you know, watch, uh, subscribe to my site. Uh, now this is work. This is new. Well, I bought an eye tracking machine um, because it struck me that uh, going back again to uh, a lot of the stuff I was reading at university about the death of the author and the way that te a text only really exists in the mind of the reader, and uh, and, I, and I think of art as being exactly the same. Actually, uh, all the controversies around appropriation are kind of ridiculous, really, because uh, a work of art is only ever active, only really ever activated once it's viewed. And, and nobody will view a work of art in the same way. And uh, so I bought an eye tracking machine to kind of test that. And uh, I've had a lot of fun playing with this in the studio. So this is El Ellsworth Kelly, uh, uh, Blue and Orange. And this is uh, me looking at it for six seconds. And uh, the eye tracking machine, what, what I've done is I've, I'm only showing you what my eye looked at. And there's a different way of representing the data. But I'm really quite excited about this uh, work because well for a start it's be it's really i find it really beautiful which is unusual uh, unlike a lot of my work i think um and then also I've, I've been experimenting with kind of creating these perspex acrylic masks that sit in front of the work and uh so these are three uh, look these are 10 seconds looking at Ellsworth kelly's high yellow and uh, and obviously you know just the way i look at the, uh, uh, high yellow transforms the work and it would be true of any of you any of how any of you look at a work transforms it in a way uh, this is red blue and uh, I use a different kind of way of interpreting the data to look at uh, the Queen this is um, a portrait of Queen Elizabeth II made in the 1950s and uh, here again it's a kind of acrylic mask that's been punctured by uh, laser cut holes um, where my gaze was kind of fixated. This was, I think uh, I only looked at this image for six seconds, but I looked at 16 of the same image uh, in, con in consecutive order. And so this is the result. So the other thing is your eye never moves in the same... Your eye never looks at anything in the same way twice. It can't. It's constantly moving. If you look at your eye on the, atomic, on the microscopic level, it's constantly shifting. It's uh, something that goes back thousands, millions of years. And, um, and so I'm really fascinated by that, that in a way uh, we have a, a, a means now to record how we see and in effect how we construct the world. So, and then this is all of the uh, dots accumulated together, the, point, the gaze points accumulated together. So in a way the, the, the eye has not really uh, uh, captured the entire image, it's only captured very specific parts of the image. And then uh, I've, uh, my, uh, 
I just did this for fun, really. Uh, but I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting um, to have a look at... Uh, I'm going to st- look into Donald Trump's eyes for, um, uh, for, for six or ten seconds. I can't remember what it was. And this was the result. <laughs> and uh, six seconds it was. And uh, so what I've done is I've built... Uh, we've, I've had a, a white acrylic box built and, uh, and had the kind of... La- the, um, the gaze points kind of laser cut out and um, I put it on Instagram as a, as a, you know, just, I thought it was funny and, um, and the New York Times wrote to me, imme- like, I'm not joking, like a minute later after I pressed post and said, can you please send us this picture, we, we, we would like to, uh, I would like to circulate it to all of my editors and I think they were seriously considering um, having it on the cover and it kind of freaked me out a little bit um, but um, I told my gallerist <coughs> about it in New York, and he's doing Paris Photo next month. And uh, literally, my f- uh, printer is w- make building this today. So I'm going to go back to the studio after uh, being here, and we're going to go and we're going to see how it looks because I've had this box built, and um, I need a title though. And at the moment, I've got P Colored Dot JPEG, which is the actual file name title on the White House on the official White House website. That's the official title of the official White House presidential portrait of Donald Trump, which I think is amazing. P, colour. I mean, what does P stand for? President-elect. President-elect. Thank you. <laughs> right. Anyway, and then I, that's great. But uh, anyway, I'm thinking of a title. I haven't really got um, any at the moment. So if you've got any ideas, let me know. And uh, then... Uh, are we doing for time? We've got 15 minutes left before we have to out. Shall I leave it there? Shall I leave it there? <laughs> have you got, has anybody got any questions? If there's no questions, I'll carry on. <laughs> Do you want to carry on? Well, I'll just finish with, what, what, with a four-minute film. That's it, yeah? Okay. So, yeah, so, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm... I messed up uh, a little bit at the beginning, but um, thanks for watching. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, like, if you like, like. If you didn't like, I don't care. But um, please watch this in the end and uh, subscribe.
Okay, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, I kind of messed up, messed, messed up on some parts. But thanks for watching. Like, even if it was horrible, and like, even if it was bad, I don't care. Comment what you thought, and subscribe. Thanks.